and if are in listen only mode. Welcome everyone. My name is Tracy Fitzpatrick and I'll be your moderator today. Thank you so much for joining us here at Netcom Learning, a market leader in promoting lifelong learning, training, and talent development solutions. We're very excited to host today's webinar, Explore the, Explore the Machine Learning Code, and presenting today's topic will be Tarun Sukhani. Tarun is an IT executive, educator, author, international speaker, security expert, agile coach, and coder entrepreneur with over 19 years of combined professional experience both in the U.S. and internationally. He has conducted various trainings as well as facilitated training workshops in Malaysia, Singapore, and various other Asia-Pacific countries with a focus on project management, consulting, leadership, and management as well as security, teamwork, and other soft skills in addition to big data. Now, please bear in mind that this is an overview of a very robust topic. We do offer a collection of technical and business courses that can be tailored towards your specific requirements. If you are interested in a further discussion, you can make an appointment with our learning consultants through our website at netcomlearning.com. Today's session is also being recorded, so you will get free access to the recording in the next 24 hours via email. Netcom Learning does help customers build innovative learning organizations by achieving a smarter workforce, adopting to change, and driving growth. We do this with a broad catalog of offerings, developing customized learning plans, and our global delivery capabilities. Since 1998, we've been empowering organizations with our managed learning services to help them reach optimal performance results and address challenges. We have nine practice areas in which we specialize. They encompass people, process, technology, and training. And today's presentation is from the data and AI practice area. Netcom Learning does offer a comprehensive training portfolio for data and AI courses. Here is an upcoming list of our public schedules, which you can see on the screen, and we can also deliver private training to teams, of which the learning plan can be customized to the specific needs of that audience. As you can see, we have first course will be perform cloud. Whoa, perform, where, where'd our cloud go? Okay, let's get back to that. Okay, we're, we seem to be having technical difficulties. I'm trying to find. Oh, there we go. Okay, so here are our courses up on the screen that you can check out. Uh, May 21st, we have Cloud Data Science. On May, the, also on May 21st, Analyzing Big Data, and the rest you can just check out right there on your screen. So these offerings can also be found with a simple search on our website at netcomlearning.com. Netcom Learning presents an important installment in its Explore the Machine Learning Code. So this is a couple of reasons why you should definitely be attending this webinar. In this webinar, we will review the whole portfolio of data and AI certifications, helping to understand which one might be right for you and tell you what you need to know in order to get started. The webinar not only helps us in understanding the difference between analytics, machine learning, and AI, but also determine the scope of machine learning and the market. And now I would like to give you a quick overview before we get started. To begin with, you do have the option to adjust the window size to your liking. Simply hit the escape key and find the zoom button on the top left corner of your GoTo webinar viewer. Everyone has been muted except for our presenters. Please feel free to submit any questions you do have for the presenters here in the questions pane and we will address them at the end of the session. A PDF copy of today's slides are also in the handout section of your GoToWebinar viewer. And now I'm going to pass this over to our presenter today who will be conducting the webinar. Tarun, go ahead, you are live. Hello? Yeah, hi, Tarun. You have the screen. Okay, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, uh, so I'll continue. Yeah, so hit hit your screen to bring your slides up at five. There we go. Okay. Okay, so welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to be exploring the machine learning code today. So I've got 45 minutes and a lot of slides to go through. Uh, so basically, uh, we're going to be covering 
Uh, what is the difference uh, between analytics, machine learning, and artificial intelligence? We'll do an introduction uh, and the scope. We'll discuss the future of work. And then finally, working with the code itself. OK, so artificial intelligence is a blanket term. It's an umbrella term. And it basically includes knowledge-based systems, rules-based systems, as well as everything else that we normally consider with machine learning and deep learning. And so this is the hierarchy here. Artificial intelligence is basically a broad field of study. As I said, machine learning is usually considered a subfield of AI. Uh, and so therefore, uh, you know, machine learning focuses more on a machine uh, attempting to learn the features of a particular data set rather than being given uh, features or rules by a human being. Uh, deep learning does complete uh, rep uh, feature representation learning. Uh, so you don't even have to know what the rules are or what the features are, uh, the, the job, uh, basically the, the, uh, the attempt is that the machine uh, you know, uh, machine learning obviously has gone quite a you know, bit distance in the last few decades. And quite recently in the last, you know, I would say 10 years, uh, deep learning has made a huge uh, inroads into uh, basically human level performance in a number of narrow tasks such as image recognition, facial recognition, speech recognition, and so on. So normally when we talk about machine learning, we talk about uh, a few major tasks. So we normally talk about classification, regression, and clustering. So classification is basically supervised learning, clustering is unsupervised learning, and basically this is about choosing from among different categories. And regression is uh, choosing a continuous value. So for example, uh, I could ask you, uh, how much is it gonna rain tomorrow? Uh, that would be a regression. If I asked you, oh, is this a dog or a cat? That would be classification. Uh, if I asked you, oh, you know, what's the difference between this set of articles and that set of articles, uh, but I don't give you a label, you know, I don't tell you if it's a sports article, whatever, if I just tell you, hey, tell me what are the differences, that would be clustering. Uh, so continuing on, we also have dimensionality reduction, uh, we have ranking, we have recommendations. So recommendations, of course, have become quite popular with Netflix and Amazon and so on and so forth, uh, but uh, these are typically machine learning tasks that uh, we are all, you know, tend to be familiar with. Uh, so in terms of features and feature representation, uh, obviously, you know, when we're talking about machine learning, uh, we have a number of different tasks that we can do. If, for example, we're talking about uh, text mining or natural language processing, uh, the features that we're trying to learn are basically semantic, right? So they're uh, syntactic, they're semantic, and that's within the realm of natural language processing. Uh, if it's image recognition, then the features it's trying to learn are, for example, edges or shapes or parts of things like faces or arms, and then eventually the whole thing. Uh, and, and so, you know, and this goes across the board. So if you're talking about sound, uh, sorry, speech, then you're talking about, you know, uh, feature representation with respect to phonemes, uh, i.e. sounds, uh, and then forming, obviously, you know, meaning from that. Well, right nowadays, of course, deep learning has kind of taken over uh, machine learning, primarily because of the number of highly accurate results that have been obtained from using deep learning uh, neural networks. Um, so anyway, the difference between uh, deep learning and traditional machine learning uh, is that deep learning exclusively uses neural networks, particularly neural networks that have a lot of hidden layers. Uh, these hidden layers are normally arranged hierarchically, uh, and uh, that's how they're different, for example, from shallow neural networks. And it's this hierarchical arrangement uh, of these hidden layers that allows deep learning algorithms to come up with predictions that 
either are comparable to human performance or in some cases even exceed human performance. So here's just an example of identifying, for example, a car, you know, and say, oh, it's a Volvo. Okay, so there's a guy named Ian Goodfellow. He's a well-known deep learning researcher. He came up with this diagram and he said, hey, you know, we started off with AI-based systems, which were basically rules-based, and we had, you know, hand-designed programs that said, like, if this, then do that. If, you know, if the height is more than this, then do this. So those are called rules-based systems. Eventually, we went into classic machine learning, where, for example, the machine uh, could do some uh, feature mapping, but not really a lot. And more, and more importantly, uh, we had to provide the features. Uh, then finally, we went into representation learning with shallow neural networks where uh, the machine could figure out, you know, some features and then do feature mapping, but, you know, it wasn't that robust. Uh, finally, uh, at the deep learning stage, we have the ability to hierarchically produce features. So we start off with simple features, use those simple features to produce more complex features, and then finally create the maps from that. So the ability to create these sets of features uh, in these hidden layers is what gives deep learning its power. So why are we having so much success with deep learning now and not in the past? So the reason is because of our ability to store lots of images or you know sounds or whatever it may be, basically store a lot of data, uh, and our ability to process that data computationally uh, through, for example, GPU clusters or TPUs. TPU stands for Tensor Processing Unit, which is a type of, of uh, 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 processor that can do a lot of matrix multiplication very quickly. Anyway, the number of cores is on the order of a thousand times or more than a CPU. So if a CPU has four cores, for example, a GPU could have a thousand or four thousand cores. Uh, so if you look at, for example, an NVIDIA Titan V, uh, it could have like 6,000 cores or some ridiculous number like that. Uh, so that means that you can do a lot of big data processing very quickly, which means you can do a lot of deep learning very quickly, comparatively speaking. And of course, the, the last ingredient was these algorithms themselves, uh, a new set of deep learning algorithms. Uh, so for example, like LSTMs, uh, CNNs and so on and so forth uh, that allow us to do things that we couldn't do before. Uh, so back in 1998, Lacan, uh, Jan Lacoon, uh, who's a deep learning researcher guy, he's currently the head of AI at Facebook. Uh, but anyway, back in 1998, uh, he published a convolutional neural network, which is what you see here. Uh, and in fact, I mean, he's the one who's credited it with their development. And uh, so he, he designed a convolutional neural network and entered the MNIST competition, which is a competition to recognize handwritten images, and he won it. And he won it back in 1998. So he beat all the other algorithms. And his network was using a Pentium, you know, I don't know what that is, Pentium something. Could be a, a regular Pentium, I'm not sure. But anyway, it had on the order of a million processor, or, uh, sorry, transistors. And this is the number of pixels that it was using about 10 million. Fast forward to 2012 and the ImageNet competition, which is uses like images of like animals and, and other, uh, you know, things in nature. And this time we've got GPUs and we have on the order of a billion transistors, which is a thousand times more transistors than we had in 1998. And of course, if you look here, again, it's like 10 million times, you know, the number of pixels that we can represent, thanks to GPUs. So in other words, uh, deep learning is really good. It seems to work. What's a good example of that? Well, we've already seen it in the news. Uh, so AlphaGo, for example, beat the world champion, both in South Korea and in China. So it completely demolished uh, both players. And in fact, the new version of AlphaGo called AlphaZero demolished AlphaGo. So these algorithms just keep on getting better and better. The GPUs keep on getting better and better. And our ability to store data, immense data sets, label data sets just gets better and better.
So what can we do uh, aside from, for example, image recognition or speech recognition, whatever? We can also do some very interesting things. We can do things like image colorization. So obviously you could take black and white movies and then put color in them. And you can do that automatically rather than by hand. So that's pretty cool. Uh, you can also caption images. Uh, you can do text image or image to text. Uh, so all of these remarkable achievements uh, are possible simply because of a class of new deep learning algorithms. Uh, of course, everyone has heard of self-driving cars, autonomous cars. So Google and Uber and everything, they're all working on this. How is this all possible? It's possible because of deep learning. So here's an example of image generation by text. So I can just write out something and a computer can search a database and actually find the closest match to the text. So that's pretty remarkable. It can do semantic understanding and convert that to an image. Okay, so of course there's a lot of tasks as I mentioned, uh, you know, speech images, video, text NLP. There's also reinforcement learning. So AlphaGo, for example, is a deep reinforcement learning algorithm. It's learning how to play a game. And then there's tons of other research out there too. So uh, here is another example of deep learning and computer vision. These are all of the different things we can do. We can even do activity recognition. Uh, so for example, uh, I could figure out if someone is shopping, uh, whether or not they're shoplifting. Uh, so obviously this has security applications, uh, but it has many other applications. So uh, for example, um, you could use it in a gym to help someone with their workout routine. You know, you could tell them, hey, you know, you're not doing your push-ups properly or something. It can actually detect that. Uh, so th this is called uh, object segmentation. So we can see that we segmented out the individual objects in the image. So we can see that we have two dogs and a bridge. And we can do this with, in many cases, better than human level performance. So for example, they did um, uh, a test on traffic signs in Germany, and they found that their CNNs, their convolutional neural networks, which is the type of image recognition deep neural networks was better than a human being. It's pretty amazing. Uh, another example of this is visual recognition of different types or classes or categories of objects. So that's what the ImageNet competition actually is about. Uh, so you can see here, uh, we're doing YOLO detection. You only live once. And it's doing this in real time. So that's pretty amazing. So this is what's happening in your autonomous vehicle, by the way. Okay, so in other words, we're doing really good. Where deep learning has taken over from other algorithms, as you can see here, and they just keep on getting better and better. In fact, they're monotonically better. That means that if you give them more data and more time, they just continue to get better and better in accuracy. So what about uh, other applications? So of course, everyone knows about Google Street View, right? Well, that's how Google actually managed to find all these addresses. Human beings are not entering it. They go look at the pictures, and a machine learning algorithm identifies the digits. So that saves a lot of time. So uh, yeah, here's the Oscars. Right? Uh, so we can see that there's, you know, applications all over the place. Uh, so, you know, facial recognition, facial detection, and all that stuff, right? So facial detection means you can put a bounding box around faces in an image. Facial recognition means I can recognize who those people are. Now, in, on top of just recognizing faces and, and who those faces are, we can recognize their expressions. So we can actually do emotional analysis. Uh, we can do food recognition, of course, and then, you know, if we recognize the dish or food, we can bring up the nutrition facts. Uh, so this is activity recognition. So it allows actually say, hey, these people are fencing. This person is, you know, field hockey and hula hoops and all that stuff. 
Okay, so this is what we're used to with uh, self-driving cars. We can see that we are doing the bounding box, right? We're doing object segmentation in real time, and we can identify what each object is. Uh, pedestrian detection, blah, blah, blah. And roadside detection mode. This is a, a LIDAR kind of image. It's called a SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping. Uh, so we normally see this with LIDAR, you know, which is like that that thing that spins around a lot in the you see in the pictures there in Uber and everything like that in Waymo, you know, it's spinning a lot really fast. So that's called LIDAR. It's it's radar using light. And so that's why you can see like a three-dimensional representation of the environment. Um, so we can, you know, there's attempts now, of course, to improve night driving and all this other stuff. But I mean, that, so we don't really have fully autonomous vehicles right now because they can't drive, for example, in inclement weather or very well at night. But, you know, we're improving and we'll, we're, we'll definitely get there, hopefully. Uh, uh, so, so SLAM, of course, these are other examples of SLAM. So you can see these are three-dimensional representations within the computer uh, memory. Right, so this is how the computer, quote unquote, is seeing things. Um, so we can also do complex image segmentation. So here you can see it can even take out the individual vegetables from a salad. I mean, that's pretty neat, right? So for example, if you have contaminated food, you know, or like let's say, you know, uh, uh, God forbid, you know, you've got some. Uh, bad stuff in your food, it could pick it up, or mold, or rotting, or whatever. So this, you know, there's the applications are endless. Uh, so if we take a look at uh, image captioning, as we as we saw with uh, where we took uh, uh, a text and we 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 figured out what the image was by searching for that image that matched that text, we can do the opposite. We can give it an image and it can caption it for us. So this is a human, a group of men playing frisbee. This is the computer, a group of young people. So that's really close. And this is a computer that generated that. So, you know, there are computers today, computer journalists today that are writing stories. And in some cases, you can't tell the difference. We can also have visual question answering. So this is great for customer support. Right, so for example, you could give it an image and say, hey, you know, uh, answer some questions based on an image. And so we, we see the beginnings, rudimentary beginnings of quote unquote reasoning in these algorithms. But obviously, you know, we're not really there yet with reasoning, it'll still take some time. What is the biggest advantage uh, that I can see in, in deep learning here is the ability to identify thousands of different uh, objects within a single scene. A human being wouldn't be able to do this, you know, in this kind of period in, uh, in real time. And in fact, there was a story just recently published in China where they identified a criminal from a, a whatever, a fugitive from among 50,000 people in a crowd. I mean, you know, that's like finding a needle in a haystack, literally. And it was able to do it with no problem. So uh, deep learning, of course, and natural language processing, uh, a huge improvements have been made there. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, I won't go into kind of any detail into Word to VEC or whatever, how these things work. Uh, but you know, we uh, way beyond uh, what we were able to do earlier with traditional machine learning. So traditional machine learning used to use for example, Markov chains or Markov processes for sequence modeling of text. And you know, now we can just replace all that uh, with advanced uh, recurrent neural networks um, or any of the modern you know, deep learning algorithms that are being created. Uh, by the way, this is a very active field. So whatever I say today could be replaced tomorrow with another algorithm. And so that's what makes it pretty amazing is that they just continue to improve. And all of this has been possible because of computational power and big data. So uh, anyway, this is just going on and on and on. Um, I'm, you know, these are just there for show. Uh, I'm not going to spend time, of course, going to detail in any of these images. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, 
what about sentiment analysis? Again, that's a subset of NLP. Uh, and again, that has benefited as well too. The results get better and better and better. Uh, in many cases, it's able to pick up on sarcasm too, provided of course there's a, a conversation or context provided. Um, machine translation. So we've seen this happen all the time. Uh, Google has improved uh, and many other you know, virtual assistants have improved tremendously over the years, largely thanks to deep learning. So deep learning now has better machine translation. Uh, in fact, Google released a product called um, uh, some kind of Airbud or whatever it was, uh, but they had a presentation of Google I.O. And, and you had two people you know, with ear, earbuds on and one spoke in their native language and the other person heard it in their language in that person's voice and vice versa. So that's pretty amazing. That's like Star Trek Universal Translator stuff. So we're already capable of that today. You know, so that's an amazing thing. I mean, we can imagine in the near future, we just walk around wherever we are in the world, we just talk in our native language and everyone else understands what we're saying and vice versa. You know, in other words, people speak in their language and we can understand it because it gets converted to English. Well, if you speak English as your native language, of course. Um, so that's, you know, automated speech translation. So, so Skype actually has that. Uh, and there's a bunch of other applications that have that too. Uh, so we can see that the quality of DNNs uh, have gotten better, uh, you know, just based on how much training you do. So they just continues to get better and better. Notice that the error rates are going down. But if you look at the old way we used to do things, right, it used to plateau. So regardless of the amount of training, it really didn't improve by much. But here we see significant improvements. Okay, so, uh, you know, of course, other companies are, are doing this as well in China, for example. Um, uh, so question answer and all that stuff I talked about already. Dialogue systems, right? So dialogue systems are also known as chatbots, right? Uh, so everyone I think is has heard about chatbots where you just type in something in a website or something and it comes back and it's responding to you. It's actually a machine. Uh, so a lot of tier one customer support is done through chatbots. They're also called conversational agents. Uh, there's, you know, they're all synonyms. They all mean the same thing. Uh, so they call that conversational commerce. So imagine in the future, you know, you go to your Airbnb thing and, you know, uh, you can have a, a uh, chatbot concierge, you know, that's always with you. And you can just ask, hey, what are the good things? Or, hey, you know, book me a, a tour of the city or something. Uh, yeah, so anyway, we're improving our quality of conversational uh, bots uh, continuously over time um, and you know better algorithms are being released as I speak um, so that's still an area of active development um, so a lot of PhDs are being you know uh, created uh, thanks to deep learning uh, what about uh, deep reinforcement learning so here we can see that deep re reinforcement learning can be used to play games for autonomous cars for drones for robotics and so on and so forth right uh, so, uh, again, I'm not going to go through these algorithms like Q-learning. I'm not going to go through that. But the point is, is that um, there have been remarkable uh, achievements uh, in, for example, gaming. Uh, uh, so, for example, uh, OpenAI's uh, gaming engine uh, beat uh, a bunch of, I mean, the best players in Dota 2, which is an esports competition that they had. And they played that game in Dota 2. and the the AI clobbered everybody. So, um, you know, so even though these are like virtual environments, we could imagine in the future where we would have real environments and these agents would be, you know, interacting in, in a real environment. Okay, so, um, so now let's talk about the future of work. Uh, so a lot of people are, you know, afraid of what's gonna happen right, because they're afraid of losing their job. Well, some people have a different picture on things, a more rosy picture, and they believe that it's gonna be a collective intelligence future where man and machine work together. And other people have a very dire picture 
like the Elon Musk picture, you know, like we're all going to die kind of picture. So what do the experts say? Those who are, are you know, working in, in ethics, in, in robotic ethics, uh, or in, in, uh, in, in, in deep learning itself, what do these people say, right? So, so they're basically saying, uh, you know, well, I'm going to go through the slides, but, but they're basically saying that um, in the short term, there will be pain, right? Just like there was pain in the 19th century uh, with industrialization, a lot of people lost their jobs and, you know, especially farmers and people in the textile industry, you know, they, they artisans and craftsmen, they lost their jobs. Um, and it took a long time, you know, for them to transition to that new economy. Maybe it won't take as much time now, but there'll definitely be some period of disruption, you know, where there's going to be like bad stuff happening out in the streets probably, but it's going to happen, but hopefully it's going to be short term and everything depends on how society handles this transition. Unfortunately, we don't really have a good history of, of, of handling this transition well, but let's see what happens this time, but it's definitely going to happen. So the auto automation of driving, what's going to happen? Well, in like 30 states or some ridiculous number of states in the United States, the most common job is truck driver. So what does that mean? Well, it means their job is gonna be in trouble. Um, but, you know, not, not in the next five, 10 years. That's not gonna happen. It's gonna happen over a period of decades. Uh, so all of these truckers, for example, what's gonna happen to them, right? Well, yeah, I mean, if the technology gets to the point which it probably will, where it can work in all types of weather conditions and all types of streets and and blah blah blah, then yeah, I mean they, they will lose their jobs. But you know, the hope is is that uh, we find different types of jobs by then. New jobs will be created, and that's generally what's happened historically, right? Uh, so as farming jobs went down, the service industry went up. So all those farmers went into the service industry. So anyway, uh, so there's a group of people, you know, that say that uh, blah, 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 you know, there's always been a fear. Well, neoclassical economists predicted that this would not happen, blah, blah. So, you know, so one group of people are saying that, uh, you know, there'll be new jobs. Another group of people like the neo Luddites say, ah, everything sucks. And we, you know, bad things, a lot of bad things will happen and only bad things will happen. So probably the truth is somewhere in between. Okay, if I were to summarize it, the Neo-Luddites are saying this time it's different, everyone's gonna lose their job, and there's gonna be chaos and permanent chaos. The Neoclassicals are saying this time it's the same as, as before, so don't worry about it, you know, blah, blah. Okay, so McKinsey believes as much as 45% of the current jobs could be replaced. Gardner, you know, uh, also did studies on this, and they said that uh, by 2025, you know, one in three jobs will be converted uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so why are the predict predictions like all over the place? You know, why is it so hard to pin all this down? And of course the answer is we don't know how the future will be. I mean, um, you know, uh, the, the, the time period for transitions, uh, historically speaking, has always been decreasing. So, you know, what, that, what I mean by that is like, for example, um, you know, the amount of time it took for us to transition to farming took a long time. And then the amount of time it took to, to transition to information technology took some time. But then the amount of time it took from information technology to now is not that much time. It's only a few decades. So the hope is that, you know, it's not too disruptive. Uh, so, of course, manufacturing, we've seen massive amounts of automation in manufacturing. And most of the job loss in the United States in manufacturing is due to automation, not to outsourcing. Right, so that's the driving force. So uh, here's the Tesla plant. Uh, there was just a story released, uh, I think yesterday or the day before, Elon Musk said uh, that we're gonna shut down the Tesla Model 3 production line for a week uh, because they over automated the plant. So this is the, like the first time I've ever heard, you know, uh, Elon Musk say that over automation is bad, but it is bad in many cases because 
if you have over automation, you have too much complexity in your system. You know, you could have thousands of conveyor belts. The whole thing is 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 so confusing. So it looks like you know, for the foreseeable future, the reality of of artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and and humans, in other words, the reality of the future of work is that human beings and machines will be working together. So in the areas where machines suck, human beings will come in, like in, in the areas of perception, reasoning, understanding, common sense, things like that. That's where human beings will reign supreme. And in the areas of boring, repetitive kind of stuff that's you know, not too complicated, that's where machines will reign supreme. And so this idea of collective or augmented intelligence seems to be the future uh, that we're going to be entering. OK, so I'm not going to talk about this because we're running out of time. So I want to quickly you know, try to get through this. Uh, so, so one thing that you know we've seen, like these here are the presidents, right? And this is what's been happening with real hourly earnings. Uh, so everyone knows what's happening, right? Productivity is going up, but our earnings are flat. Why are our earnings flat? Simple, because of automation, right? Uh, so in other words, human input is not as valuable as it was before. Well, what does that mean? If people are not earning more money, that means we have growing inequality, right? So that inequality leads to what? It leads to social unrest. And that's the fear, right? That's the fear that everyone has. That all this automation without proper guidance uh, from policymakers can lead to social chaos. And we see that. We see the middle class is shrinking, you know? So, so all these signs are quite bad from an economic standpoint. But you know, automation is not to blame for that. Automation also leads to lower prices, more availability and abundance of products. Those generally are not bad things. I mean, I don't think anybody would say that, hey, you know, uh, if I can buy a cheaper phone or whatever, cheaper TV, that's a bad thing. So um, the bad thing is, is that we need to figure out what human beings can do in, you know, instead of whatever they're doing now. So I'm not going to go through all the bad stuff. This is like the bad stuff, right? So because everyone talks about good stuff, so I wanted to at least bring the other picture, you know, or other vantage point into 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 full view. Um, this is just showing labor force participation. Obviously, it's going down because of automation. Men without work, of course, that's going to go up because of automation, and so on and so forth. So these are all like you know dire signs, right? But there's ways of handling this, and that's called policy. So what this is telling us is we better get our act together and figure out what human beings will be doing in the future. Uh, so um, uh, so death versus Trump and blah, blah, right? Um, so you know, that's, you know, a lot of people argue that that's why Trump won, right? Because of the job loss. OK, so. Um, Malcolm Gladwell also, you know, put in his two cents there as well uh, about this phenomenon, the future of jobs. Um, and yeah, so we can see that uh, U.S. had an explosion. See this? U.S. went way beyond everybody else, um, you know, uh, and, and, and a lot of this has to do with automation. Okay, so um, uh, this is all, you know, basically about relative speed. If we go too quickly into the future, right, we're going to have a lot of social unrest. But if we pace ourselves properly, we can deal with this transition better. And I think that's what we should try to focus on. So the future of work should be the fu it should be a gradual transition uh, to a more augmented collective intelligence future. Uh, this just shows the difference between how companies were before and how they are now. So, for example, uh, you know, like Snapchat had like 13 people and sold for a billion dollars, right? I mean, that's just ridiculous. So, in other words, the number of people that you need to generate huge amounts of value is minuscule in comparison to what we needed before. So, you can compare Walmart to Google, right? Walmart hires like 2 million people. Google maybe hires like you know, 
I don't know, 60,000, 100,000. Uh, yet Google's market cap is huge, you know, bigger than Walmart's. Okay, so what about the, the last portion, which is what type of, you know, code do you use to do all this machine learning stuff? So the most popular language for machine learning is Python. Why? Because Python has a lot of the libraries. So Python, for example, has uh, tons of libraries for machine learning and deep learning. So for deep learning, we have TensorFlow. For deep reinforcement learning, we have Reinforce. For, uh, you know, neural, uh, for deep learning uh, architecture, we have Keras. Uh, PyTorch is another deep uh, neural network. Piano is another one. Uh, Mahout and Deep Learning for J. These are both for Java. Dialogflow was acquired. Uh, this is for chatbots, right? Uh, and Spark MLib is another machine learning library. It's for Java or Scala. But anyway, you've got a choice out there, right? Uh, there's plenty of libraries there, and uh, you know you can code uh, either in Python or Java or or you know, uh, or even in R, it's possible. Uh, anyway, so Python, as I said, is the most popular, and the libraries that are most commonly used for machine learning are NumPy, which is for vector, uh, which is the vector ma uh, matrix library, uh, the vectorization matrix library, and then we have SciPy, Scikit-Learn, and Stats for descriptive statistics. Uh, this is for image processing, and you know the list goes on and on. So um, so in other words, for analytics, right, we can use stats models. For machine learning, we can use scikit-learn. And for deep learning, we can use TensorFlow. And uh, I think that pretty much concludes uh, the presentation. We can uh, leave it to Q&A. Thank you so much. That was quite informative, and yeah, we will get back to some of those questions in just a few minutes. But first, I'm going to fast forward these slides so we can talk about what is coming up next with Netcom. Uh, we are celebrating our 25th anniversary to serve you with best in class IT and business certification training. And we bring you an unbeatable 20th year celebration offer this month to make your learning even more fantastic. We are offering up to 50% off on some of our popular courses. Netcom Learning offers a comprehensive portfolio for data and AI courses, which you can check out right there on your screen. So definitely, I'm sure you're going to want to sign up for several of those. Team training can also be customized and accelerated to meet your organization's specific needs. You can contact us today to be connected to one of our learning consultants to help advise you on your specific needs. You can reach us at email, webinar at netcomlearning.com, and you can also search our catalog at netcomlearning.com as well. And we all know that technical skills are necessary to empower our careers, but do you need to improve or upgrade your leadership skills as well in order to accelerate your career? Along with your technical abilities, develop the skills you need to manage yourself, others, and business better. Welcome to Sarter Learning, a collaborative knowledge platform bringing the world's best business and leadership insights from Fortune 1000 leaders, best-selling authors, and Ivy League professors. Further, if you are interested in learning from the top American leaders, you can log on to the e-learning platform at SarterLearning.com and avail the special promotion meant for first-time users. Simply use coupon code SARTER10 and begin your leadership journey now. And right now we are going to launch a quick poll to find out how many of you might be interested in taking some additional training. So do take some time to fill that out before you all have to log off and get back to work. In addition, we have a lot more informative webinars coming up. So go to netcomlearning.com backslash webinars in order to register. And don't forget to follow and like us on our social media pages to get the latest technology updates. You can refer to our GoToWebinar chat window for all of our links. And now let's go grab up some of those questions. The first one comes from, let's see, where did it go? Okay, we did have a question. But while we're um, going through those questions, are there any other uh, final thoughts that you did want to add before we do have to end the session? Tyrone, do you have any other final thoughts? I think I'm pretty good. Yeah, no final thoughts.
All right. Well, I guess that's going to. And oh no, we do have a question that has just come in. Okay, the question comes from Albert, and he would like to know which languages are suitable for AI. Okay, so as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, the most common one is Python, and the the reason for that is because of the Python libraries uh, that already handle a number of things within traditional and uh, deep learning and uh, a lot of new algorithms uh, that are you know created uh, uh, tend to be immediately available uh, in Python uh, and also Python has something called Jupyter Notebook uh, so it allows you to run Python within the browser so this way you can share uh, your code with other people very easily and run your code within the browser um, so that is a huge benefit, and that's the reason why Python is is really up there. Another language uh, that you can do it in is Java. Uh, Java has an advantage of speed. Uh, so Java has really good multi-threading. Uh, it has really good security, really good performance. Uh, and there's libraries like Deep Learning for J, which is a deep learning library for Java. Uh, but it also has traditional machine learning libraries like Apache Mahout or Spark MLib. So um, really, those are probably the two biggest ones. Uh, R is also there as well. Uh, and of course, then there's proprietary commercial tools, uh, but I'm not going to discuss the proprietary ones. Okay, next question. Why uh, is Java not considered as proficient a language compared to Python for machine learning? Okay, it's not a question of proficiency. It's just a question of library availability. So Python is an older language, number one. Number two, Python was created specifically for scientific computing, uh, and that included machine learning. And so this was already back in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, and you know, of course, when Java first emerged, Java was not used for scientific computing or machine learning. Its first use case was the web, applets, and you know things like that. Uh, and then eventually business uh, uh, application development. So it took Java some time to catch up, you know, into these other fields for which Python had already been used for quite some time. Okay, well, thank you, Tarun, and thanks for all of you for joining us today. And if you do come up with any additional questions, feel free to send them to webinar at netcomlearning.com at any time. We hope that you found today's webinar informative, and we look forward to seeing you back here with us soon. Feel free to tell your friends and colleagues about our webinars and other courses. Have a great day, everyone.